Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cropper here. I'm going to be going over three books here about uh, planning the curriculum for schools. And then I'll be mentioning a fourth, talking a little bit about what I'll be doing for my curriculum. The first book we'll look at is Developing the Secondary School Curriculum. Now this will come into play a little bit later, books like this, because at first I'll be doing the primary school curriculum, but this is published in 1946. And I just want to get one little definition from chapter 12. Uh, the term core for core curriculum has been used for a number of years to refer to subjects which are required of everybody in the school. Uh, or it has been used to refer to the part of the curriculum considered to be the general education. Now, we won't go much more into that because that's secondary school curriculum, but just to note that when we're talking about early education, we're talking about stuff that the, every kid should get. So there's not a lot of option in the early years, up to like the age of 12, let's say. Um, there can't be too much option in the curriculum itself. The kid can read what he wants outside of school, but you pretty much have to get the same stuff into all the kids so that they can go on their own from there. And there's not a lot of room there's some, and the kid can do stuff on his own, but the core curriculum refers to that which everybody needs. The next one, which I'll be doing some in depth for here, is a practical guide to early childhood curriculum. Uh, I will be educating four to six-year-olds uh, for the first year. That will be the age group that I work with. And so I'm going to need uh, a practical guide to early childhood curriculum development. This uh, book I have here by Claudia Eliasson and Loa Jenkins, published pretty lately, 1994, so it's about 13 years old. Um, this book is current. You know, it was used in a college classroom within the last uh, three or four or five years. So I'm going to give a few samples and let's see, uh, you know, what sort of things they're teaching people. Let's start in the preface and we'll just do a few paragraphs and we'll go on uh, to chapter one. <coughs> now, uh, we're going to start the third, third paragraph down. So. Uh, it's in the middle of the context, but we can roll with it. We also emphasize that the child is the center of the curriculum, and the curriculum should encompass the whole child. Physical, social, emotional, creative, and cognitive. Sounds good, right? This book focuses on areas of the curriculum and effective methods of curriculum implementation. We teach how to present concepts to children, while developing understanding and thinking in the early years. This book is for children of three to eight years of age. Good to know. Um, so then, <laughs> makes a little note right here. It says, a number of major changes have been made in this textbook's fifth edi edition, including rearrangements of some of the chapters. Multicultural and diversity concepts have been included in chapter four, People and Their Diversity goes on and says a few other things. Good to know that we've got diversity well represented. Now let's go to chapter one, an introduction to early childhood education. Um, <coughs> uh, now I'm going to quote selectively. This is just a little uh, four paragraph introduction at the beginning of the chapter here. And it says here in the middle of the chapter, um, although the focus of this book is on children from two to eight years of age, most two-year-olds need a very relaxed curriculum schedule with an emphasis on play. Most two-year-olds. Um, it is during early childhood it is suggested that more concepts and structure be added to the curriculum very gradually. However, we wish to emphasize that even though there have been major sociological and technological changes in our society over the past ten year over the past years, developmental rates they say have not accelerated. So they're saying, even though technology is accelerated, be wary, humans still can't learn very quickly. 
Children need environments and learning experiences that are geared to their needs, not focused on highly academic curricula and planned by what adults think the children ought to be learning or doing. Kind of a condescending attitude towards teaching, I guess. Let's just do that one more time. Children need environments and learning experiences that are geared to their needs, not focused on highly academic curricula and planned by what adults think children ought to be learning and doing. These children, two to eight years old, need child-centered environments that encourage learning through play, exploration, and discovery. <sighs> chapter 2 stresses the importance of play, but this is chapter 1, so blah blah blah, but look at that. Children from up to 8 years of age need child-centered environments that encourage learning through play, exploration, and discovery. Okay, I can only say that I disagree. Now, uh, it talks about early childhood education, chapter one here, and it gives some of the um, early childhood uh, education theorists. It mentions Frederick Froebel, Pestalozzini, it mentions uh, Rousseau, Margaret Macmillan, uh, John Dewey, Sigmund Freud, Maria Montessori, Arnold Giselle, and a few more, and we get third page here. <coughs> Teachers must be cautioned not to emphasize formal, structured academic in instruction for young children, because when they do, miseducation is the result. The public, as well as parents, must demand excellence in education of administrators and teachers. Now, that's interesting. They sort of changed the subject. They didn't give any reason. What is miseducation? Now, I read all the material before and all the material after it, uh, and they don't give a definition of miseducation. They don't give any evidence for miseducation. They don't explain what miseducation is, why it's bad, or how it happens because of a highly academic curriculum early uh, in the child's education. They don't even explain what it means for it to be um, structured, an emphasis on structure. Uh, so they say here, teachers must be cautioned not to emphasize formal, structured academic instruction for young children. They don't give any reason for it. This is dogma. This is dogma. Being taught in the state schools to um, to our would-be teachers. Now, then just a little bit later here, it's talking about goals, goals for early childhood education and what we need to do, what should be on our current agenda. And it says the following are some specific suggestions for early childhood education goals in the future. Um, that we should adopt and enforce state quality assurances for child care and early childhood classrooms. State, adopt and enforce state quality assurances. Bring the state in on all aspects of early childhood education. That's number one on their list. Number two, increase state support levels for Head Start and other comprehensive and compensatory early childhood programs. So again, bring the state in on it. Number three, increase state appropriations for child care. More money for the child care. From who? The state. Number four, get this one. Get this one. We should make it absolutely unacceptable for the wealthiest nation in the world to have the poorest children. We have the poorest children. That's the most asinine statement I've ever heard. The United States has the highest child poverty rate when compared to eight other industrialized nations. The poorest children of who? Of the world? Is it the world's richest nation? The poorest children of who? Of this country, you know, eight countries or what? I don't even believe there are statistics. Now, poverty stricken in America means you only have two color TVs in the house instead of five. Poverty stricken in America means uh, that you may or may not have an automobile. You might have to ride the bus around. So, 
you know, poverty stricken in other countries means starvation. Anyways, so it talks about how we have to start a, taking money from the rich and giving to the poor um, through childhood development programs. That's their fifth point, or their fourth point. Number fifth, number five, force the mass media to stop defiling U.S. society with the notion that everything can be as instant as fast food. Force the mass media to stop defiling U.S. society with the notion that everything can be as instant as fast food. Force them? How? Censorship? Thought control? G you know, government TV and newspapers? What the hell are they advocating? Now, it goes on number 6, number 7, number 8, number 9, number 10. It goes up to number 13. We won't go on any further there. Uh, it goes over games and the nature of games. The children should be able to play games. And it says, uh, games for children in the early childhood years should be simple to play and non-competitive. Now, they have just I'll just give this little tidbit here. For most children, it is believed that elaboration of basic concepts is preferred to rapid, accelerated learning in the cognitive domain. Okay, so don't, don't, don't try to give them rapid, accelerated learning in the thinking skills. Just uh, elaborate their basic concepts. That's better for them. Okay? The inappropriateness of early academics. This is page 17 in chapter 1 here. Generally, how we teach influences success or failure more than what we teach. Curriculum content, strategies, or teaching methods that put too much emphasis on intellectual achievement can misuse these early years. And it gives the reference to Connell, 1987, Elkind, 1987. As a profession, we must stand up for what we know is best for young children and not take them on that road based on our research and experience that we know is wrong. Buckner, 1988. Elkind, 1987, believes that the national trend towards pushing young children to achieve academically has led to using inappropriate teaching methods and development and developing unreasonable expectations for kindergarten and pre-kindergarten children. So there's unreasonable expectations. These parents are upset that we want too much too early. I mean, my God, I, th I thought it was getting worse. I thought we wanted less and less all the time. And I guess it's probably because of people like this. And it goes on and on. It says there's a dangerous trend towards teaching skills earlier and earlier in educational settings, increasing the stress and failures felt by our youth. The college curriculum is being taught in high school. High school in blah 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 elementary is in kindergarten the kindergarten is in preschool oh my god we're that's because the curriculum is being dumbed down so much that there's no problem shifting it back 10 years now uh, it says a little bit later here young kids have young children's curiosity causes them to seek to learn about and make sense of the world their learning style is spontaneous and needs to be self-directed rather than teacher and program directed. Learning style is spontaneous. The learning style of children shouldn't be directed. It shouldn't be given structure. It should just be spontaneous. They should learn spontaneously. Um, provided with appropriate curriculum experiences, uh, children can pace their learning in such a way that it will closely parallel their growth in understanding. Learning and understanding. So they'll learn and the close parallel will be to understand. How can you separate those two? This is academic drivel. This is bullcrap. And they're, and they're saying that you can't teach kids stuff too early. What is the meaning of spontaneous? They give no source for that. I mean, they give academic sources for some of the stupidest assertions, and then they make a massive assertion, like learning technique, the 
The learning style in children is spontaneous and, sh and should be self-directed rather than academically guided. What does it mean to be spontaneous? They give no explanation at all. Now, <coughs> a little further down, under a section called How Children Learn. Keep in mind the previous discussion of how children learn and the need to avoid pushing academics, thereby eliminating unnecessary pressure from teaching too much, too soon, too fast. Too much, too soon, too fast. <coughs> Since the child in the stage from two to seven years is a concrete, non-evaluative thinker, I do not agree, it's, it's not true, who takes things as they are or as they look, many sp and they don't give a reference for that, many specific first-hand experiences are needed, and teachers should avoid abstract concepts. From up to seven years of age, you should avoid abstra abstract concepts. So you can do a... When you kids come to school today, uh, you can do a day on fish, or a day on the postman, or a day on painting. You, you, you couldn't, for example, do a day on the Greeks. Oh, good lord. And they actually do give um, those two, those two uh, examples, a day on fishing, where fishing is the theme, fish as the theme, including fishing, and sharks, and dolphins, and jellyfish, and learning how to swim. That's what they call education. Now, uh, feedback and cognition. In other words, finding out where the kid's at. It says, simply because an experience has allowed a child to become familiar with an idea, it must not be assumed that the correct information has been assimilated. Right? So, so how do we find out whether the kid's got the answer right? Right. So we taught him something, but does he understand? Did he really get it? They're true. They're they're right. That's that's a problem. So in the quest for meaning, a child often misunderstands. Thus, an adult or a peer must observe and listen constantly to determine the functioning level of discernment. I don't know what they mean by functioning level of discernment, and they don't give any definition. But through feedback from the teacher, a vital consideration in providing information. The child learns which stimuli should be focused upon. Now, this is academic drivel for once in a while you have to give the kid an exam to see what he knows, and then you have to correct his mistakes. However, they've taken exams and testing out because they're too stressful, so they just put in this freaking drivel. But anyways, they're right. You do need to give exams, and you do need to correct the child's mistakes. <coughs> now, uh, it goes a little further, and now it has a section on cooperative learning among peers. Children learn from one another, and this learning includes cognitive and affective perceptions. I don't know what affective perception is spelled A-F-F, -F, but, um, Someone once said that the idea that children learn social skills by playing together is the, uh, like the idea that they would learn good table manners by sitting at a table with a bunch of kids. So, children don't learn from each other. You can't just leave them in the group and watch them grow and flower and develop. That's baloney. The most effective way to learn uh, these kinds of skills, the type of skills we want, uh, is in small groups where the focus is on team effort instead of the individual, on helping and learning from one another as opposed to competitive approach of learning. Uh, now I wonder why is the individual approach to learning competitive, you know? Why why do I have to be competing with him if we're both learning about the history of Greece? Why? Why is that competitive? And it certainly doesn't give any um, 
uh, source for the idea. It, it just has these wild assertions. And then it gives academic sources for some of the stupidest things. We skip a little further. At the same time, we have evaluated the results of inappropriate pressurized learning. Um, since this book is concerned with teaching young children, we've looked at the processes by which learning takes place in the young child. We found that experiences, feedback, and clarification of misconceptions are the three foremost aspects of learning. At the same time, we've evaluated the results of inappropriate pressurized learning. There, I mean, I read the chapter. They didn't. They did not. They, that's the only that's the statement right there. We have evaluated the results of inappropriate, pressurized early learning. No. In about three different places, they've made the assertion that you can miseducate, that you can misuse the early years, that uh, a highly structured, formalized curriculum uh, stifled the child's spontaneous learning. But they never proved anything, they never gave any sites, and they never even gave a logical pie-in-the-sky reason, uh, let alone connected it to any reason in reality. And here at the end they say this is the most important part, and they give this off. No such results were cited, and there was no evaluation. So that's how they end chapter, chapter one on uh, academics. So basically the chapter was, don't teach kids too much too fast too early. Chapter two. Can you guess? Play. I just want to show you the cover of the book again. Okay. Chapter two, play. <coughs> now, um, it has the introduction here, and then it says, much has been written about the values and the purpose of play, uh, and uh, it says, sometimes parents come into the kindergartens, and uh, if you know the information we're presenting in this chapter, you'll be able to answer the parents when they say things like this. Is that all my child does, just play? Uh, the information in this chapter will aid you in responding clearly and wisely to such queries. Is that all my child does? Just play? So these academicians who write these books have heard this stuff from parents. And here they are. They're going to defend it. Are you ready? During play, children have the opportunity to develop the sense of touch, taste, smell, sound, and sight. Now, just between me and you, that's just learning. That's just walking around. You, you you develop those when you're eating supper. So so they develop them during supper, during play, and at all other times that they're awake. But okay. In addition, their attention spans are expanded as they ta stay on task. Their attention spans are expanded as they stay on task and remain attentive to activities in which they are involved. So by playing, by a kid focusing on what he wants to, he gets a longer and better attention span. Now, that means that in these schools where kids are allowed to play all the time, they should come out with a tremendous, great, enormous attention span. They should be able to sit for an hour or two hours and listen to material being presented. I don't know where these kids are, because all of the kids are being you know, put in these play environments. Where's all these high attention span geniuses? Uh, <coughs> and let's see, it goes down a little further. Even though play is a vigorous intellectual exercise, it does not create the pressure or tension that is often associated with more structured learning approaches. Now right there, it gives play and structured learning as two approaches to learning. And it says that it is a vigorous intellectual exercise. Play is a vigorous intellectual exercise. And it gives Rogers and Sawyer's 1988 as the evidence for that. That's bizarre. That is bizarre. And then to compare it to structured learning and to say that it, it it's highly vigorous, like structured learning. 
but it doesn't create the problem structured learning does. They've invalidated structured learning, if you believe what they're saying. Although play is not a necessary condition for learning language and literacy skills, play is probably the best environment for these abilities to thrive. Creativity, <coughs> Creativity and aesthetic appreciation are developed through play. So we see that play is very, very important. It's, it's better than learning. It's better than structure. Uh, and it's, it's how everything good happens. Play allows children to develop into social human beings. It provides practice in being less bossy, less selfish, less meek, or less shy. Did you know play allows practice in those? Play encourages the child to be a friend and a contributor, to cooperate, and to be flexible. So playing with other children, now you have to make sure he plays with the other kids. Okay, Self-directed, free play periods, uh, in terms of values and benefits, may be the most important times of the day. The children should not be robbed of free play periods. Every day should have a, a, a one block or more of time for spontaneous play as much as possible because the structured learning time is damaging. Now, <coughs> go a little further down here we find the teacher's role. Interesting. The teacher's role is to provide, encourage, supervise, and guide the play of young children and to help them reach their potential. So the teacher's goal or purpose isn't to impart knowledge, or to educate, or to develop their minds. Okay? It's to guide, encourage, supervise, and help them reach their potential. How do you help them reach their potential? It doesn't say. All this mushy bullcrap. During play, children need many opportunities for making choices. As they make choices, they feel in control, which results in their being able to accept responsibility. Uh, from Kelman, 1990. However, children's interests will dwindle, and they may even stop playing if teachers interfere too much or try to structure their play for them. Rogers and Sawyers, 1988. But let's go back to that early, earlier one. As they make choices, they feel in control which results in their being able to accept responsibility. Now that's really strange. Kids become responsible by playing. Why? Because when they make decisions, they feel like they're in control. I'm missing the logical connection. I don't see what's going on there. I think it's bullcrap. Go a little further down. Well-planned play during early childhood is more important than adult instruction or formal structured learning activities. One more time. Well-planned play during early childhood is more important than adult instruction or formal structured learning activities. Eisenberg and Quinsbury, 1988. <coughs> Didn't it say earlier that structure makes the child uh, lose interest. Uh, children's interest will dwindle and they may even stop playing if teachers interfere too much or try to structure their play for them. Then at the end of that same paragraph, it's not even a different paragraph, at the end of the same paragraph, well-planned play during early childhood is more important. Now what is the difference between well-planned and structured? I guess there's a big difference because well-planned play is more important than adult instruction or formal structured learning. Well-planned is not structured. You got me. Uh, you got me. Okay. So let's go on a little further. For younger children, simple concepts such as shape and color should be presented, rather than concepts such as time, money, and more complex shapes. 
Age-appropriate materials, equipment, and toys are suitable for, ch for the child's age, interests, and abilities, and children gain most from materials matched to their stage of development. Now, I've read further into the book, and they keep talking about this, matching the materials and the lesson and the theme to the child's developmental needs. They never define developmental needs. They never give any evidence for uh, evaluating them or knowing where the kid is at in them or how certain things affect them. It's just academic drivel. It's nonsense. And they keep saying it over and over. Preparing a physical setting that is developmentally appropriate and curriculum supportive. It's the next section. Uh, the outdoor play area and the indoor classroom are the center where the child learns everything and they have to be supportive of the child. These two areas must be planned to focus on the needs of the children while supporting the curriculum and what is being taught. The teachers should know and understand the age characteristics of children so that they can identify developmental changes and needs at different stages in order to select the proper equipment, materials, toys, furniture, and other learning aids. Now that is a tremendous subject. It just say to develop to identify the developmental changes in children and their needs at different stages. Their developmental changes and the needs of different stages and how that is affected by equipment, materials, toys, and furniture, and other learning aids. Now, if they simply mean each year when you teach a new lesson, use more complicated stuff, that's fine. But it doesn't seem like they're saying that, and I don't know what the heck they are saying. A little further down, it says, An organized, attractive, clean, cheerful, or warm setting results in more positive children's behavior and teachers' attitudes. In addition, the vi environment should offer opportunities for learning and increasing skill in all developmental areas, physical, social, emotional, cognitive, and language. An organized, attractive, clean, cheerful, or warm setting results in more positive children's behaviors and teachers' attitudes. Organized, attractive, and clean. I can take that. Cheerful and warm? I mean, why put that in? Why? What does that even mean? Guidelines for arranging the early childhood classroom. Toys and, mat and materials should not be stored in boxes. They, things should be on shelves. They should be neat. They should have their own place. And they should not be stored in boxes. Why? Because if a child desires to play with a soldier that happens to be at the bottom of the box, and he dumps out the whole box of toys to obtain the soldier, the child may become angry or frustrated when he's told to pick up all the other toys. The child may honestly say, But I didn't play with all the toys, only the soldier. Also, toys and equipment should be complete and in good repair, blah, 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 blah. It's frustrating to put a puzzle together with a piece miss. So you, so you shouldn't s store things in boxes because it can lead to the child... Uh, dumping the box out, and then being upset because he has to pick them all up. That's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in a textbook in all my life, and I've seen some really stupid things in textbooks. Okay, go down a little further. The following are suggested guidelines for arranging the physical settings of an early childhood uh, classroom. It says the equipment and materials must be the correct size and height for the children. Fine. The room must be organized and uncluttered. Okay. Uh, a disorganized, cluttered uh, environment frequently ignites similar behavior in children. Classrooms are more orderly and interesting when teachers avoid putting everything out at once. For instance, if your classroom has six puzzles, put only one or two out at a time. Interesting, it says this about books, I think, a little bit later on. Don't put all of your books out and make them all available at once because the children get bored with them. But if you rotate them and there's different books out, you know, sometimes, then they will be continuously interested because it's changing something new. You know, what's a library? 
a library is all the books out at once. Is that bad? What is that? So, number three, make certain that the room is free of stereotypes. Pictures, toys, materials, dress-up clothes, or other objects should reflect the diversity of people and gender. Number four, consider the traffic flow. Number six, the classroom and outdoor areas must be clean, neat, and cheerful. The physical environment must be clean for health and sanitary reasons alone. Cheerful, bright touches combined with carefully selected bulletin board pictures can support the theme. Okay, number 11. This is the last one on the list. Each area and each piece of equipment and material should have a purpose and a meaning. Each area of the room and each piece of equipment and material should have a purpose and a meaning. In evaluating the areas and the equipment, ask yourself such questions as why am I using this and what am I trying to accomplish? Remember that the physical setting should serve the needs and interests of the children in the classroom. That's, I mean, what, what are some examples of that? In what way? How is the furniture related to the developmental needs of the child? What the crap is that? I mean, some of the, I mean, this is drivel. A lot of this is stupid, and the rest of it is obvious. Like, the equipment should be the right size for the kids. You know, you can't have desks or chairs that the kids can't sit at. Duh. Anyways, just going along here a little further. Um, then it says, um, in the creative arts and dramatic play role, and these toy areas, if you use human figurines, make sure that they reflect diverse people. And then it goes on to the next paragraph. Just It's just an assertion. Just make sure there's diversity. Period. Just make sure there's diversity. It's absolutely necessary. It's dogma. You have to have it, they say. And then they say there should be a book nook or a quiet area that provides a place to explore the world through books. Books should be selected to meet the developmental needs of the children and can support the theme or the concepts being taught. And the theme and the concepts, like I said earlier, things like the, you know, fish or postman. The entire book supply should not be displayed at one time. Occasional book rotation stimulates renewed interest. When a book is selected, there should always be a rug or a table nearby for reading or for being read to. <sighs> okay, go a little further here. It gives some guidelines for um, fitness and motor guidelines for helping the kids develop their large and small muscles. It says competition must be avoided by early childhood teachers. Competition pressures lower children competition competitive pressures, lower children's self-esteem, produce rivalry or anger, cause withdrawal or a sense of failure or inadequacy, and decrease the quality of learning. Competition is really bad. So, so you can have a game like, you know, toss the hot potato or something like that. You have, can't have a game where someone wins or someone loses and you keep score, because competition is bad. You heard all those ways it's bad? That list right there? That's baloney. Kids have fun uh, playing games. And you're not going to save his self-esteem by not playing a game where he loses. I mean, if his self-esteem is that delicate, there's a thousand other problems. Now, uh, we come down here, it talks about physical games. And it's got ten thing, a list of ten things about physical games. Number three is make sure that the games are non-competitive. It says this again. Children cannot tolerate losing before the age of five or six years of age. Focus on skill development, having fun, and encouraging a sense of fair play. Now, if you can't win or lose, and if it's not competitive, what does fair play mean? But whatever. Number six. When the game has reached its peak of interest, change activities. Why? When the game has reached its peak of interest, change activities. So, so just when everybody's having fun with it, and say, okay, that was great, we had a great time, put that away. Why? I don't get that. Do not match boys against girls, number eight. 
and it says uh, make sure all children are allowed to participate and explain the rules to all the kids. And then it talks about field trips. Field trips should support the theme. It says you can walk to them or you could ride the bus. It talks about free dramatic play. Uh, one type of dramatic play activity, often referred to as free dramatic play, is set up during individual play for children who choose to participate. An area of the room is set up with desired materials. The children need not be told what to do, since the materials will suggest possibilities to them. Their own experiences and imaginations will be all that they need. So, then it goes on to say that usually the kids end up playing house, but they may also play hospital, or school, or carpenter, or business, or whatever. Additional possibilities for dramatic play areas include a shoe store, dentist office, television station, dress shop, men's clothing store, airport, space station, gardening center, farmhouse, barn, circus, play, fashion show, greenhouse, and pet store. I think uh, to, to print that information in a textbook and charge people money is a farce. Uh, the equipment that you use uh, should be simple and free of detail. should be as simple as possible and free of detail, and this encourages versatility, imagination, variety, and appeal. Why? Why is detail bad? <coughs> now, uh, whatever equipment and stuff you have around the room for the kids to play and learn with, uh, the, there, there should be some of they can be teacher initiated or child initiated. Frequently, when the child initiates the play, it may simply um, involve exploration. So teachers can suggest, model, or prod, but remember, ultimately the children should determine how they want to use equipment and materials. It's up to the children what to do. So the child's just there. Uh, the, the child's in charge. You know, the uh, the teacher just hangs out on the side. The teacher's just there. The child decides what to do. Now, <coughs> that's the end of chapter two, and do chapter three later, but I think you're seeing the asinine nature of um, early childhood curriculum. It's, it's really bad. Fifth edition, Claudia Eliasson, Loa Jenkins.